Welcome, my name is Vince Moreto uh, with Empowering Pumps and Equipment, and this is Lunch and Learn with Vince. My guest today is Proco Products, Mike Lassus, the president and CEO. Mike, welcome and uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. I, uh, start from the beginning. How long have you been at Proco Products and where are you coming from and yeah. where are we going in the future? <laughs> Vince, it's always good to see you. You know, I, I appreciate the time we do get to spend together and talk. So I've been with Proco Products for about 28 years. Uh, I, I'm a veteran of the U.S. Navy. When I got out of the Navy, I was kind of looking for a job and have, had a friend that was employed here at Proco. And she said, we have an opening. And I applied and not knowing the industry or knowing the what a, what a rubber expansion joint was at that time. And we've kind of grown since then. But uh yeah 28 years ago october it, I, actually i just celebrated my 20th anniversary i've been employed with proco products uh started out in the customer service department kind of worked my way up through that and marketing uh outside sales amazing uh, ownership and now yeah here i am 28 years later as the president wow it, that's amazing because you know you don't see anymore you don't see people that actually stay in it for 28 years there's a lot of hopping around so my hat's off to you for that um, i appreciate that i yeah and again appreciate your service in the navy that's probably got its own set of uh stories that probably reflect how you manage thing at pro things at proco as well um but but for for a guy like me that knows very little about the application Tell me what expansion joints are. Tell me what their uses are. What industries in particular do you focus on? And a little bit of, about your products. Like, you know, when you were in that role in at Proco, learning the company, learning what the products do, maybe you can share an instance where you walked into a client, and assessed the situation, you made some suggestions, and you earn a partnership for life with them, you know, because no, of that. Abs yeah, absolutely. Like, like I said, when I started, I didn't know what an expansion joint was and, you know, trial by fire is always for me, the kind of thing I like, I, it's just under the pressure and you learn. And, and when you pick something up and, and it just kind of clicks in your brain, it, it, it helps. And, you know, like I said, I started on the customer service desk. So at that point, you know, I'm on the phone with customers every day, uh, helping solve, application problems and and not knowing so again i'm gonna i'm gonna if i if you don't mind i'm gonna share my screen real quick sure. and kind of show you a, a typical application of of a rubber expansion joint so what you see are are chilled water pumps so what an expansion joint does is anytime a a a pipe thermally contracts and expands it moves and we need to take the stresses off the pumps, as you see here on both the, the inlet side of the pump, which is the suction side of the pump, and then the discharge side of the pump, uh, we have expansion joints. And what happens, that allows the, the pipe to grow and, and contract and expand, takes the, vi takes the vibration off of your pump and pump bearings. I know you've had some pump guys on here and, and the pump repair guys, and using the expansion joint takes the stresses off the the bearings of the pump and keeps that keeps that shaft in line and keeps i think you'd rather replace an expansion joint than a pump any day sure you know, it's, it's you're exchanging a five dollar part for a five thousand dollar part right that's interesting realistically and so yeah i mean expansion joints are used all over and you know i kind of like i was on the inside sales desk for about six years so you know, I was able to see and, and hear a lot of different applications. The time came and we were, Proco was looking for another outside sales manager. We had our vice president of sales was retiring at the time and a natural uh, progression through the, through the company, Rob Coffey, who was our vice president of sales and marketing at that time, took over his spot and they were looking for, you know, somebody to fill Rob's spot on a regional sales manager thing. And I did. And, and my first, my first, Again, my first trial by fire was, I don't have pictures of that one, but I visited a job site at Lake Mead in Arizona. And, and you know, we all know Arizona is hot and in the, in the summertime and kind of cooler in the, in the wintertime. So 
they were doing a large project on Lake Mead and I saw a lot of different, you know, expansion joints and what they did. And it was kind of my first real hands-on working with a contractor and, and seeing, you know, that was my first time really going out and seeing things in the field and being able to work with them and, and solve their issues. And they had a lot of pipe misalignment issues. Uh, you know, it was, it was kind of a, a good application for me to get my feet wet, but, you know, again, working with contractors and trying to sometimes tell a contractor they've done things incorrectly. It doesn't always go <laughs> the friendly way, but you know, the ultimate, the ultimate goal and the ultimate resolve was it worked. And yeah. we got things fixed and, and Las Vegas has a, a working plan. Right. So you're showing uh, your screen now. It looks like you're trying to fish out another fi uh, photo. Oh, yeah. I was going to different different kinds of, of expansion joints. I forgot I was sharing my screen. No, that's fine. I want to ask you a question, though. Uh, and this is where it kind of. I'm, I'm looking at these. These are fascinating structures. I mean, they what what precipitated the invention of the expansion joint? I mean, like you said, obviously this thing would have been just a rigid pipe connecting pump and motor. And then one day somebody said, man, there's a lot of uh, uh, flex or stress on that pipe, right? Oh, sure. And, and so and so this, you know, the expansion joint was born as a result of that. But what was what? What indicates uh, what, what happens? I mean, it, it, you actually see the pipe flexing and uh, causing well, stress on the pump, or I mean, is you it know something? What? That's a that's a that's a great question. It's a, it's it's one I like to to answer quite a bit. It's a great history lesson. So back in the 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 originator, the, the original manufacturer of an expansion joint was a company called Uniroyal. And you nod your head, you know who Uniroyal is and what they do. Yes. They built tires. Yes. And and somebody way back in the 1932 to 35 region area came to Uniroyal and said, look, I, I'm having these piping problems. I keep my my shafts keep getting out of alignment, my bearing misalignments. I have I have, you know, pipes that are giving me issues. You guys are a rubber manufacturer. You guys know the industry. Can you do something? And Uniroyal was that again, the first manufacturer of a rubber expansion joint, they said they used the same technology. And I was trying to find a cutaway um, of a one of our 230 style joints just to just to show you. Sure. So uh, a tire is built with a tube. It's built with some polyester reinforcement in between the plies, and then it's got a cover. If, and if you were to see a, a cutaway of an expansion joint built the same way. Okay. So if you if you were to find one, and, and, and I apologize, you can't find one uh, right off the top of my head here, but expansion joints are built the same way as a tire. So Uniroyal manufactured expansion joints for about 20 years in the 1950s. They decided they were going to sell the business. They wanted to get out of the expansion joint business. They got it off the ground. They got it moving. They wanted to focus back on tires. So they sold to a company called Protective Coatings out of Fort Wayne, Indiana. So Protective Coatings started manufacturing rubber expansion joints and other companies started coming along and, and building expansion joints and kind of copying the process. So we partnered with protective coatings for a number of years. And then in 1982, Proco was founded. And at that time we partnered with protective coatings and started selling expansion joints uh, around 1980. They wanted out of the business. We purchased all their tooling, all of their processes and shorten the name to Proco. So that's where Proco gets his name is from protective coatings. Okay. We kind of shorten it up. So in 19, so since 1982, we've been manufacturing rubber expansion joints in all different series. Um, I'm just yeah, take your time. I mean, again, this is super casual. So if you need to click a little bit and take your time, I mean, there is, you know, this is very helpful just to know a little bit more. Oh, sure. And, and, um, I, a, a little heads up. I also want to hear more about the that duck bill uh, flexible the valve that I'm I'm curious about that too. That is a oh, sure. little product. I mean, it's so it's so basic, and yet I could see how it's just critical in certain applications. 
particularly like storm water and things well, like that's, that. Well, and that's the thing, you know, that was one thing, you know, we developed that in 2005 and I'm still just trying to, to, to finish the, to wrap it up on the expansion joints. But again, in the, in the expansion joint side, just, just to kind of further along, there's so many different types and styles depending on what pipe does. So pipe started out as carbon steel pipe, stainless steel pipe, and then the plastic the plastic industry started to evolve and then we started dealing with PVC pipe, FRP pipe now. So as that industry grew, you know, so did ours. We had to adjust to different piping materials. So now we have expansion joints that are designed for specifically for PVC pipe. They can take up the, the low stresses and they can take up uh, very low spring rates to get those, those things to move. Um, yeah, if you want to share a picture. Let me share it again here. This, so yeah, this sure. is... So this is a PTFE expansion joint. Oh, um, yeah. Again, specifically designed for plastic pipe and applications. It allows that plastic pipe to thermally contract and expand, and it contracts and expands much differently than stainless or carbon steel pipe does, or ductile iron pipe. And so, you know, it all different applications, different things can run through it, whether it be water, you know, hydrochloric acid, we can handle effluent, you know, we solids, we, we have expansion joints to cover everything. And, and, you know, we've been doing it uh, for almost 40 years now. And so we become kind of a consummate professional. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so I could go on forever about expansion, but I'm going to go back to your, your question about yeah. the, 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 yes, the duck, tell the me. Duck bill check valve. Yes. So, in in two thousand five, as we as we were growing, and Proco sells through a vast array of of manufacturers reps in the in the industry. So, one of the industries we cover obviously is water and wastewater. For a long period of time. Um, people had asked us to, to come and, and do duckbill check valves. Well, at that time there was one company that did it. It, it was, it was red valve or tide flex and they, you know, they had patented valves and, and we stayed away from it. Um, you know, we, we have patents. We don't like people to infringe on ours. So we didn't infringe on theirs in 2005, they became available. And so Proco got in the market, uh, of rubber duckbill check valves. Uh, we found a gentleman out of, Canada, Cal Hayes, who is our the general manager of our ProFlex division now, and he was with a company in Canada, and he was looking to, you know, expand his 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 role and his knowledge. So we brought him on as an as the expert. He had over at that point twenty years of experience in manufacturing the duckbill check valves, and so he he got the line off the ground, and we started moving. Uh, it took us a while to, you know, to get tooling built and to get things built. And I'm going to look. Yeah, take uh, your time. Yeah, for those pictures. So a ductile valve allows water to flow. It's a, it's a backflow preventer is what, is what that is. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to wonder, I'm wondering what we did before the, that duct valve was available. That Well, and, and that's just the thing, you know, one, the, 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 what people were doing were just like simple gate valves. So, so metal gate valves. Yeah. And what's interesting again, in 2005, I knew what a duck bill check valve was. I'm just going to open up and I'm going to share this again. And we can talk this, this will lead us to, to a bunch of different uh, conversations. Sure. So there you have a multitude of check valves, you know, and this, this picture happens to be in Australia. Um, so what a duckbill check valve does, it allows water. I don't, can you, does my, you see my mouse? Yes. Yes. Okay. So it allows water to flow through the valve and, and come out into the drainage area. This is off of a ocean front or, or waterfront property. So behind all of these valves are, is the city. And when, when you, you and I are walking down the street, we're walking down the sidewalk and we see the gutter. We just think, oh, that's where water drains. And that's what, you know, any, anybody that doesn't know the industry, that's where water drains. Well, all of that rainwater and stormwater, when they go down the drains, has to go somewhere. 
Yeah. And so in this in this case, the storm water the, the, the is pumped out into the ocean and allowed to drain off. So all of that all that storm water, the pump pumps will kick on, water comes through the valve, drains out into the ocean. In a high tide, this is happens to be you know a low tide instance. The picture was taken at low tide. When high tide comes in, water can come back up. Our valves will completely shut. They'll seal tight. Water can back up. It can back up as high as the top of the valves, as you see, and it won't allow any of the that high tide water to flow back up the up the system. So it's quite interesting. It's a very it's a very simple design, maintenance free. Mm -hmm. So again, we go back to the question: What was done before? They were metal flat gate valves, and you know they they tend to seize and rust and bind and stay open, and th thus not doing the job that they're intended to do, which is prevent backflow. Right. So you throw on a rubber ductile check valve, um, it opens under pressure and then it closes when the pressure drops and it's done. You, right. you install them and you walk away. And, what's the lifespan and, of what's the lifespan of one of these? Um, we're, we, we say anywhere from 35 to 50 years. We've replaced valves that have been in place for 60 years. That's amazing. That valve has been doing them a long time. Um, but as long as they're, they're built to withstand the, the ozone. They're with, built to, to withstand sunlight. They're, with, they're, they're built to withstand, you know, the flow, flowing water. So as long as there's no natural disasters or we've had, or, or animal disasters, we've, we've had valves that were chewed apart by a beaver. Yeah. yeah. And so we've seen those. And, and so now we've, we've worked with our engineers and our, and our, uh, our designers to to put in compounds into the into the rubber that beavers don't like, so it becomes it becomes rodent proof, um, oh, barnacle and algae resistance in in navy applications or in pier applications uh, when they're they're severely underwater. Um, diffusers is another is another big. You got role. a picture? You got a picture um, of a diffuser? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at, look for one right uh, now. Sure, take your time. I. I'm I'm curious about the all these products and how how does a sales call happen when you walk into somebody and they're using say a metal a metal uh, gate valve or something and then you present this product to them and then you tell them it could last 30 40 years I mean they they got to love you. <laughs> they, 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 they love us. They scratch our heads. So it's, a, it's, it's more expensive. It's a more expensive fit. Oh, I guess I didn't have to stop here, but now I'm going to. Yeah, that's fine. It, it's a, it's a short term expense maybe, but in the long run, it's probably well worth it. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. So. I guess you probably see the an array of different pictures right now. Right, you're going to show it. What is this a diffuser? So this, this is a, this is actually a diffuser being built. Okay. I think you got a probably a black screen right now. Yeah, right now I'm just looking at a black screen. Yeah. All right. Well. Okay. So here we go. This is an uh, outfall diffuser that's being built on. They do all the work inland. And so you have this large diameter pipe. In this case, it's probably around a 36, 36 inch diameter pipe. And they want to they want to take effluent, raw sewage or dirty, filthy water. They take it out into the ocean where the currents are, and they slowly diffuse the sewage and the, and the effluent into the ocean and let the currents dissipate it. Yeah. And so they build all these on the ground, a 36 inch pipe, and then these little manifolds with our check valves on. And so their their position probably, as you can see, are probably every 10, 12, 15 feet, depending on on how the engineer has designed it. They pump, they they build it on the on the ground, and then once they get this whole diffuser line built, they'll slide it out into the ocean. And again, they can bury it to a depth of however they need. I mean, we've, we've got ocean diffusers that are, uh, you know, about 30 to 50 feet beneath the surface of the water. Wow. Wherever, wherever they need to it. And, and these are all simple effluent diffusers. Interesting. Uh, 
it came back up. So there's 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 a better picture for you. Oh of, yeah, yeah. Of of the finish, this is built in house, and they put it on the diffuser. And here you can see, you know, that that is quite a long diffuser. This is over. Oh yeah. Top. Wow. Yeah. And so yeah, that's you know it's it's things that you and I don't really know what's going on in the background. Right. You know, we all know, we all know that we go to the restroom, we flush the toilet, and it's gone. And and where does that go? It get, has to go somewhere and be processed, whether it be a, a wastewater treatment plant, or in this case, they take the dirty water, the effluent that needs to be dissipated. They'll they'll take it and run it out in the ocean and and let that let that go. Right, because I mean, from a and then the microbes do the work of breaking it down. Right. You know, it actually becomes a, a source of protein and food for microbes, I guess. So um, I could see that. That makes a lot of sense. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. So those are, you know, those are just things you learn. Like, you know, in, in working with Cal Hayes, you know, he's, he's, he's got a wealth of knowledge and, and he continuously, this is, these are his designs and he knows where things go. And like you said, when we're talking to customers and, and explaining to them, that there's other avenues of what they're trying to do in backflow prevention, it's become unique, you know, and, and, and right now what, what Proco is now getting into is, is a world of um, aeration. So aeration is another big thing in water and wastewater treatment. You have these, these, these ponds that are water and solids and they need to continuously put air into them so they don't become right. stagnant. And stink. I mean, we've all we've all been by stagnant water, yeah. and so Proco right now is is getting into. I'm going to open up. Sure. Now, let, while you're doing that, let me ask you: it, you, you say they're getting into aeration. How recently did this uh, evolve? It sounds like you know there's some. It's it's new, relatively new. Am I am I right on yeah. that? Aeration has been around. I mean, you've been in the industry for quite a bit. You've you've run across uh, fine bubble uh, diffusers, coarse bubble medium. There used to be coarse, there used to be fine medium and coarse bubble diffusers. So you know, there's companies out there that does real quality uh, fine bubble diffusion. And fine bubble diffusion is is as I was getting ready for this presentation, I was trying to think how can I easily explain it to Vince what a fine bubble, when I say fine bubble and coarse bubble, I know, but how can I define it to Vince? So let's say you're sitting <laughs> in a restaurant or a bar right. and the, the real little cocktail straws that they sometimes provide with drinks, right. if you were to, to blow through that straw into your glass, you would see real little bubbles being, stir your, your cup around. Sure. Now let's take, you know, let's take a full size straw and start doing the same thing. And then you see, bigger bubbles right that's exactly what they're doing in these aeration ponds and 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 you know things like that in order to get the stratification and and ozone and induce oxygen into the water to, to prevent the, the stink and the, and the filth so fine bubble diffusers just do that they, they blow but sometimes um when you're dealing in effluent ponds that have solids built in a fine bubble diffuser isn't really your 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 choice product because it can the solids can block the the the, the fine bubble diffusers and, and and create problems. So that's when we we've created. I don't think I've shared it yet. So this is what we've come out with, and these have been used again for a number of years. Um, what we call coarse bubble diffusers. We use our we use our duckbill check valve. Again, as the as the mode to create the backflow prevention, but as they blow air through this valve, it creates it burps, it fine bubbles, right? And do it at real low pressure, and it creates real coarse bubbles. And if you're dealing with solids, when the air shuts down or when they don't, the solids will not will not plug this port. So this will open up into this is a three inch valve. So the opening of our valve here is three inches. Right. Um, they inject air through this three quarter inch nozzle. As the air comes in, our duct bill will open up into, it'll go into a full port design. I'm, I see. 
I was I was I was working with my hands while I was saying right. That. But so I get that. Valve yeah. Sits, the valve right. will open up into a three full. You know, it can open up as far as the full three inches of port, but it injects what we need to call now coarse bubble diffusers. Right. And the next time you and I are together, if I see you blowing through a straw, I'm gonna. That's what yeah. we're gonna be doing. You're, you're gonna yeah. you're gonna go home and you're gonna create. This is what Mike was talking about. And I got you. It helps break up the solves and it helps you know, stir that around and, and create, you know, and, and do the job that the engineers and the, and the treatment plant operators are looking for. And so we right. just now got into that. Uh, WefTech was just, you know, a few weeks back and we actually, that was where we just introduced, you know, our, our foray into, into the, the diffusion, the course, the air diffuser market. Right. Right. Yeah, well, and by the way, how do you think WefTech went? That was a pretty good show, wasn't it? I thought so. Man, I, I, I think this was probably one of the best shows. Obviously, we're just coming off, um, you know, COVID and, and getting back to, to post-COVID uh, trade shows and meetings and travel. Yeah. I think this is one of the best WefTechs I've seen even pre-COVID. Yeah. Um, we, that the, the first day especially was I, I I was telling my guys, I said, I was standing in the aisle and in New Orleans, there's just that one main aisle. And I turned around and I could not see the floor. All I could see was heads and head and shoulders of people that had just packed the show floor. And it was so incredible to see because trade shows have really taken a hit. People wonder, do we get out of trade shows? You know, our trade shows a thing of the past. And I think actually this, this, when this previous WebTech proved that they're not a thing of the past. You know what? I, I, I tend to agree with you. Um, I don't think, I don't think trade shows are going to be a thing of the past for a, a very long time because the, the need to connect for, for humans is, is really there. And, oh, and, and this is, this is one way of connecting just through, through you and me through a zoom like this, but, yeah. but um I think it's always going to be a, a key component, but what I really think that happened, especially at, at WefTech was um, people got a taste of being denied. Right. So when they, when they, when the covers off and they're allowed to go back out and do something, they became much more intentional about having mm -hmm. intentional conversations with people and, there was no time to waste. No, know. there wasn't. And I didn't I, go there know, to kick the tires. He went there yeah, to have. I had, I, we had numerous conversations during that time where, you know, somebody would come in, they'd see what we had to offer. They, they, they had a problem. We offered a solution and they're like, I'm so glad I'm here. I'm so yeah. glad we were able to talk. You know, it's, it's fun producing. And, and like you said, I think COVID has taught us that we can do these kind of things, you know, these kind of learns and learn a lot. But it's like right now, I, I keep wanting to grab onto a shelf or grab a product to, to, to show it off. And face to face is always good. Yeah, I think, you know, um, my marketing team here, Mikhail, Will Mikhail Williams, we, we talk about these things. We're like, OK, what do we want to do with trade shows? Um, you know, coming up next week, I'm doing the, the epic with with you guys. And I'm really looking forward to that because that puts that's going to put us in front of students. And it's going to put us in front of engineers and in a in a live lab experience right. which is very exciting for me it's not a treatment plant these are students that are wanting to learn the industry and you know i get to take my 28 years of of starting out fresh and and where i am today and and, and get to to show that to the group i'm excited yeah, i think it, if we position this recording well i think it would actually be a great precursor to any any students that might check this video out and and learn a little bit about it, because when you're when they're at Epic, it would be a good uh, talking point to, oh, to know a little bit about your history. Um, which brings me to a question as far as history at Proco, without naming names or you know company, you know we don't want to we don't want to bring any customer to the foreground. But can you give me a general story of I went in. I, I got a consult consulting spot with this customer or there was somebody invited me in to talk. I evaluated the situation and presented these solutions and they, they, they took those to heart. Can you give me an industry that you did that to or 
through, through your career that um, a story, if you will, of where you came in and. Yeah, I think one of the, the, the better success stories for me was actually in our own backyard up in, in Sacramento, California, we had a treatment plant. And again, this is when uh, sodium hypochlorite was just taking a, a, they were just learning sodium hypochlorite in, in their treatment systems. And again, I, I previously I said, you know, plastic pipe was introduced. So they, they were using more and more plastic pipe and they were having issues coming off of a plastic tank. And um, so the, the engineer had designed a great application for the plastic tank field. And the problem that they had is, is the piping was, was at the bottom of the tank and then it went out into, it branched out into the rest of the, the plant. But when they designed it, the plastic tank was empty. They designed their piping system. They they put it on 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 not anchors, but they put it on guides, pipe guides, and they said, "Okay, we're we're good. We've got everything where we want it to go." And then they filled the tank. So what happened when they filled the tank is this is the the, the lower part of the the nozzle where it comes out of the piping. So as they filled the tank, that plastic tank expanded. As that plastic tank expanded took that discharge nozzle and it turned everything down oh. as, as, as the, as the tank grew, the nozzle changed direction, which changed direction of the pipeline uh, for a hundred feet. Oh boy. And I was, you saw me go off to the side because I did have pictures of that, but it, I had a picture where it, it just took and it, all the guides were misaligned and it lifted pipe off the ground about a hundred feet down the pipe. And the engineer was just kind of scratching his head. I said, how can I do that? I designed it. I've got it on guides. And, and that was kind of the first thing for me is, is, is I, I learned something from it because I learned that, you know, you have to anchor your pipe too. So what I learned and what the engineer learned at the same time, we, we created the, the resolve was you have to take sections of pipe in, in 10 feet, whatever increments. And, and isolate it with a pipe anchor. So now you got 10 feet of pipe, you're gonna deal with the motion and then and then go down the pipeline. And we also learned, you know, the engineer then learned that he has to these, and we talked about the glass half full situation. Mm -hmm. we, we learned that he, you need, that he needed to design his piping system for that tank half full. So when he goes the rest of the way, it's only gonna give him a little bit of movement. If it's completely empty, it's gonna give him a little bit of movement. So we've isolated it. And we've accommodated now again for that pipe going down. And that that was one of the, the first real success stories because, you know, I hadn't really dealt with it, but we created a solution for his problem. So so tell me, how did you accommodate the, the flexing when the tank was full? I mean, was there... Uh, well, and that's, and that's when we started using... Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, again, kind of steer away here. I'm looking for... We use more and more expansion. What we did is we 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 found an expansion joint that could take that initial right movement off of off of what we call the nozzle of that tank. Right. And then down the down the road, once we got the segments isolated with pipe anchors, we put an expansion joint in between each one. Yeah. So now we we only deal with 10 feet at a time. Got it. And then we say, okay, that that pipe is going to contract and expand an inch and a half. We put an expansion joint in there to handle that 10 feet of movement. And then, I see, you know, right I see. down the line, you know, we resolved it. Cool. Cool. And was the, were these uh, tanks, are they the big square ones that, that, that have the sodium hypochlorite? You know, the, 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 they're almost cubicle looking tanks. Well, some are cubicle, but some are round. Yeah. Um, this was, this was, I think like a, two, a 500 gallon tank, it, just a round tank yeah. that they set on a concrete slab and, and put the bulk sodium hypochlorite into yeah 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 i see those i've been to a couple of wastewater treatment plants where i see those in various places and piping little tubing going all over to, yeah exactly to, yeah it's yeah yeah when you look at it on a on a nationwide basis that's a a lot of sodium hypochlorite and a lot of tubing going everywhere so oh yeah interesting oh you know what i think i just 
You found a picture? Sure. I, I might have. Oh, yeah. So here's kind of what we were dealing with. I, I think you see it now. So this is that nozzle off of the off of the tank, and this was just an early picture. So when that tank filled, this nozzle was actually sitting, it's sitting on the ground now that we're, we were still working on it. But as as the they filled the tank, this nozzle pushed more into the ground, lifted this pipe up, and then you can just imagine going down the line what the rest of it was doing. Yeah, yeah. How interesting. Um These are all the, the SAC regional and and these are kind of what so this is kind of you kind of see this is flexed a little bit. So this is taking up movement. Now we started to fill the pipe and you kind of see that there's a little bit of angular deflection in that expansion. I and mean, that's what it's designed to do. Right. Pick up that movement. So you know, going forward, it's it's not going to lift it up off the ground but like it was. Interesting. So let me shift gears again with you, Mike. I I'm curious. So we've talked a lot about water and wastewater, um, but Proco provides services to the chemical, the petrochemical, food processing, HVAC, industrial, marine, mining, <laughs> oil and gas. And I'm reading your website now. Do it all. Yes. I mean, you're all over the place. You really, really have a a spot in just about every industry. I'm kind of curious about the um, the food industry. Maybe you can tell me a little bit about that one. Uh, where are some of the applications in food industries, for example? Well, in, in food industries, you know, in our own backyard here, we have a tomato processing plant. The we Heinz or Hunt's tomato. You make tomato sauce. So again, using the the same food grade materials. And we walk distributors through there. One of the one of the fun things I like to do with a distributor when I take them into one of these plants, into a food processing plant, is to take a, a look around. Sometimes when we're dealing with distributors, they may be, their primary focus may be gaskets and seals. And when they go into a plant, they're looking for gaskets and seals. When I'm walking them through the plant, I like pointing out the piping systems because somewhere there's a pump. On that pump, you probably put a gasket, but you didn't notice there was an expansion joint right next to it. And so you walk through it. And the unique thing about food processing plants is obviously you need food grade material. And so Proco has, we've, we've done a great job of modifying our formulas. We actually have NSF 61 certified materials that can be used in both potable water plants and food processing plants. We can use the molded PTFE, which in itself is a food grade material, but we were the first rubber expansion joint manufacturer to actually make a rubber expansion joint NSF-61 certified to use nice. in these kind of applications. Very cool. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I want to thank you for spending a little time with me. I've, I've learned I, absolutely. I, I kind of ramble on sometimes, but you know, no. like, like we said, I, I filled 28 years of, of experience and, and just, I love talking about it. I, it. And it shows, and it's a great company and heck everybody I've met just loves it there. So you got a good thing going for you. I, I want to just it. thank you for spending some time. And uh, I hope that we can do this again and do something. Maybe if you have a, a new product coming up or, you know, a new market. Yeah, I think it would be great to, to come in because, you know, like you said, you, you know, you, you asked about a success story. I'd like to take one just and just talk about a specific project and because we can talk about it from start to finish and kind of see what we've done for somebody. Sure. And I appreciate you taking the time to, to, to have these kind of conversations and, and help us in the industry out by getting our names out there and our, and our knowledge. Well, it's my pleasure. As you know, I mean, we, we both have kids, you know, that are in our 20s or in their 20s or whatever. And, and um, I think the goal that I've set forth when I originally wanted to do this was just be a little bit of a, uh, I guess you could say a little file that uh, people could go to years from now and, and look up and, and just understand that, you know, the goal here is to just take a little bit of tribal knowledge, pass yeah. it down. If it helps somebody, great, you know, and if it doesn't, then uh, move on to another 
lunch and learn with Vince and see if that one helps you. <laughs> and see but what the we overall. Do that's the goal is really just exactly. you know someone's got to someone's got to uh, document what were the challenges you know back in the uh, in the in the twenty twenties mm-hmm. and uh, and before and and that's the only way that we can learn in the future is if we you have know, Vince, 20, 20 years from now, people are going to say, what was ductile iron pipe? Why did they right. have challenges? What was that? Yeah. We're dealing with this space age material now. And it's right. what was ductile iron pipe? Yeah. Tesla piping. <laughs> Tesla piping. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> hey, anyway, thank you. And um, listen, folks, if you get a chance, just like and share this with your friends. And uh, stay tuned for another Lunch and Learn with Vince. And I, w- I once again want to thank Proco Products and Mike Lassus for being both a good friend and a good provider of services out there to the rotating equipment industry, the water, wastewater. Come- well, Mike, you got any last words? Any word is a pipe. We can help you out. Thank you, brother. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.